Good morning, everyone. This is Chris Martin. I'm here with Rick Schwader. This is another episode of Half Hour of Heterodoxy. Uh, Rick is a professor of cultural, cultural anthropology, excuse me, and a professor of human development at the University of Chicago. He's written numerous papers on uh, cultics, but also about academic freedom, um, about restrictions on academic freedom, and about the changes in the culture of the university. Uh, he's also written about multiculturalism and diversity and issues related to that. So uh, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to be here. Let me clarify one thing. Um, oh. Although I have appointments in numerous different programs, departments, and units at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. my main intellectual home is a very interdisciplinary department called the Department of Comparative Human Development which has sociologists, anthropologists, psychologists, biologists, and that's really the center of my intellectual life there, although I do have connections of one type or another with both psychology, anthropology, South Asian studies, and so forth, which I think speaks, some, speaks to the interdisciplinary character of the University of Chicago and the degree to which there are not terribly fixed boundaries that separate people in that community. In any case, yeah. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification, too. I know one of my friends here at Emory University, Jun Chung, was one of your advisees in the Department of Human Development, and he's in sociology now. And I know that some people from that master's program go into psychology, so it's definitely a, a master's program that sends people in various directions. Right, including education. I have several former students who are in departments of education as well. Right. Well, speaking of education, I wanted to start by talking about uh, multicultural, multiculturalism and diversity, which you've written extensively about. And since we're an educational organization ourselves and it's part of our audience's undergraduates, what do you think undergraduates entering the university, entering any American university right now, should know about multiculturalism and diversity? Well, first of all, I think they should start by understanding that the very concept of multiculturalism as it is used these days is a very ambiguous politicism, which ironically has almost opposite meanings depending upon whom you talk to. Um, the easiest way to divide it up would be to say it's sometimes associated with what's called an inclusion agenda which is often associated with affirmative action, especially inclusion of particular minority groups like African Americans into mainstream professional subcultures. And in that sense, it really doesn't work in the service of diversity because its goal is inclusion into a common, generally middle upper middle class ethos and set of goals, values and pictures of the world. Next mm -hmm. to that is what's sometimes called or in opposition in some ways to that is what's sometimes called the sovereignty agenda, which I associate more with Native Americans, for example. We have at the moment probably over 500 sovereign, semi-sovereign tribes in the United States associated with Native American subcultures. And there the goal is not mainstreaming, there the goal is the revival of historical traditions um, and so when multiculturalism gets used to include both inclusion and sovereignty, which tends to be more separatist, you can see you have a very confusing concept. Um, I think it's also associated with um, equality um, or some desire for a certain concept of equality. So when you put together inclusion, sovereignty and equality, you have complexity and you have to in each case ask yourself what's the relationship of any of those things to the concept of difference descriptively multiculturalism is basically an attempt to point out that there is diversity and difference between groups in their goals values and pictures of the world as made manifest in their practices um, and their way of life in their lifestyle um, it's not at all clear that difference is going to follow from inclusion. In fact, you might think quite the opposite. Um, it's not at all clear that difference and equality are compatible with each other. In fact, I think there is some reason to think that they don't go hand in hand, that if you're pressing for equality, you're often pressing to make things uniform and homogenized. And um, to that extent, 
um, you're working uh, against diversity. Uh, sovereignty, um, is, which involves some degree of separation and local self-determination and control over your own way of life, certainly is compatible with diversity. In fact, in many cases, that's the point of having sovereignty so that you're not dominated by the goals, values, and pictures of the world of some hegemonic group. So you're entering into this very complex scene from an analytic or intellectual point of view. Practically, I think what's happened on college campuses with respect to movements which would describe themselves as multiculturalist is that they subscribe to the view that everything is political um, and the slogan that even the personal is political, family life is political, um, is one mark of a certain attempt to assert the role of power um, in relationships and in institutions and to acquire power. Um, speaking truth to power, I actually think, is not what it's about. Quite the contrary. I think it's often about trying to gain power to um, uh, implement one's own goals, values, and pictures of the world. And increasingly, um, the concept of intersectionality has become quite popular among on college campuses and among um, people who would see themselves as multiculturalists. Um, I think it's not stretching it to, you know, there used to be a slogan, workers of the world unite. Um, it was this kind of internationalist, very left-wing view of workers of the world uniting. All I right. think now it's been replaced by some kind of view of victims of the world unite or oppressed peoples of the world unite, um, which is one reason that on college campuses, there's some chance you're going to find that uh, local movements on campus are going to press for solidarity between, let's say, Black Lives Matters and um, Palestinian movements to boycott Israeli academics or to divest from investment in anything having to do with Israel. So there's a kind of press for an in, for a broad solidarity between um, groups or subgroups who have a narrative about a history of oppression of their own group. And if there is such a history of oppression, that then unites you. Um, that kind of concept obviously works against a different view you might have of intersectionality, which is the view that the particularities of people's own group histories actually make them different from other groups who've had histories and that you really have to understand those. So um, there are certainly many third wave feminists who um, do not think that the idea that sisters of the world should unite or that there's a universal sisterhood makes sense. They actually think their third world experience as women is not the same as the first world experience of women, let's say, in upper middle class populations on the east and west coast of the United States. And in that sense, they believe there's a kind of interaction effect in a statistical sense, producing very different outcomes depending upon the mix of things that are true of you. But in any case, that's that's the kind of discourse that's that's going to welcome students when they come to college campuses and the at least with regard to the topic of multiculturalism. Right. So on that issue, you know, some of those topics come up during orientation or during small workshops, but then some students gain some deeper knowledge of these issues when they take courses in any of the social sciences and depending on which of the social sciences you take courses in it, you, you might approach this in, um, in, in different ways. So in anthropology, which is where you uh, primarily publish, and, and that's your discipline, um, do you think students who major in anthropology gain a more nuanced understanding of the tension between the sovereignty argument and the assimilation argument? Or do you think the field of anthropology could do a better job of that? Well, I think the field of anthropology, and now talking about cultural anthropology, I mean, anthropology covers a lot. Um, right. The profession itself thinks of itself as a four field profession with archaeology being one of those fields, biological anthropology, linguistics and cultural anthropology. 
pro I would guess that at least 70% of all anthropologists are cultural anthropologists, and that's what I'll talk about. Um, within cultural anthropology, I think the field has been fractured for decades now, and one can identify broadly certain different approaches in anthropology. Um, um, there's no mm -hmm. doubt that people who might call themselves action anthropologists or uh, are interested in identity politics or view anthropology as inherently having a moral agenda of a certain type are going to have a somewhat different approach than people who might think of themselves as skeptical postmodernists, for example. Right. Uh, and again, I would distinguish them from those anthropologists who still see the word science as an important part of what they're doing and might even describe themselves as neo-positivists who <clears throat> are prepared to simply try to document regularities in the world and do that as reliably as they can with as much validity as they can and would hesitate to make evaluative judgments as anthropologists. In fact, the neo-positivists I'm sure are committed to a view that there's a difference between is and ought, and they're interested in what is, they're not interested in what ought to be, at right. least not anthropologists. They'll have personal views about it, but they would bracket those and separate them from any authority that would come from doing anthropology as, an, um, as a science. Um, the first group, um, the identity politics activist part of anthropology, um, I think we'll have very strong social justice views and egalitarian views. Um, <clears throat> that doesn't mean they will necessarily examine in any depth the kinds of distinction I, that I was drawing. Right. Um, I would say that the skeptical postmodernists um, are skeptical enough that if they really practice their postmodern, their, their version of postmodernism, mm -hmm. they're unlikely to feel comfortable with strong moralistic statements about what's objectively good, since they have dissolved the notion of objectivity to such an extent that anyone who's making truth claims about the good themselves would be, or about what proper gender relationships should be around the world. Um, I think. Um, they would be corrosive of any statements. They'd view that as dogmatic uh, if they're true to their own postmodernism. There is a strand of anthropology, um, which is one that appeals to me. Um, I've sometimes described it as the romantic tradition in anthropology. Um, it's a certain kind of humanism, which um, has a place for cultural differences in people's goals, values, and pictures of the world. And there, the aim of anthropology is to represent what's sometimes called the other in such a way that when you're faced and confronted with differences in goals, values, and pictures of the world and cultural practices that you find disturbing or enraging or disgusting or just exotic and puzzling, um, your aim is to see whether or not it is possible to represent it um, such that you could see how morally reasonable, rational people might actually embrace those beliefs or subscribe to those practices. So in that sense, anthropology becomes a kind of translation of difference. Um, it, it, there are a set of methodological rules that anthropologists, at least at some point in their history, used to uh, see as central and were part of the training of an anthropologist. And part of that was to bracket your initial intuitive gut responses to observing difference and don't make judgments initially because of a high self-consciousness about parochialism and ethnocentrism in those judgments. That's not to say that at the end of the day, after you actually understand the so-called native point of view, after you try to appreciate the contexts in which people live, the histories that they've had, at the end of that day, you may come to the judgment that what they're doing is immoral or exploitative or 
is simply a result of authoritarian and tyrannical power imposition. But the idea is that you wait on those judgments. You should be slow to judge little known others. Um, and to the extent anthropology does that, I think it makes a great contribution to a genuine multiculturalism in which you actually are prepared to accept that people can live together in the same society even though they have rather big differences in their goals, values, and pictures of the world. Um, right. <clears throat> that's the kind of multiculturalism that certainly I, I subscribe to. Um, and one of the reasons I think that the United States is exceptional, not entirely unique, but exceptional nonetheless, is our capacity to have enormous amounts of cultural diversity within one society. Um, but it's threatened. It's threatened now by nativist movements. It's threatened now um, by attempts to promote uniform standards um, in all aspects of life. Um, all of those work against diversity. The exceptionalism, I think, in the United States case is that we have a relatively thin concept of citizenship compared to many other societies like European societies. We don't demand, you know, we don't say to be an American, you must raise your children this way. To be an American, you must have these religious beliefs. Um, uh, to, to be an American, you have to have the following concept of gender relations. We've had a history of really valuing religious freedom and the kind of cultural diversity that goes with that. And the requirement, the uniform aspect, has been something like what's sometimes called constitutional patriotism. The sacred document is the Constitution. You don't have to agree on the interpretation of it, but you have to see that as the central founding document about which we're going to all be engaged, about which we're all going to care, about which there will be debates. Um, but loyalty to that, I think, ends up being the definitive feature of citizenship, but not substantive views on all of these other existential dimensions, because we we tolerate a lot of diversity. I mean, if you look at the Amish, you're going to see a very different way of life. If you look at Satmar Hasidim, you're going to see a very different way of life. Um, and the, the, one of the things sovereign, the sovereignty agenda is about for, for Native Americans is to be able to restore certain customs and ways of life that they feel were obliterated by colonial or conquest, um, by colonialism or conquest. Um, to the extent that we're able, and our federal system lends itself to that as well. I mean, the idea that we have divided sovereignty, that we don't have a single central hegemonic government, but allow for local control, states' rights, a, t a limited number of things that are in the center, other things that are that can go in different ways in different areas in different states, permits diversity. Um, Fifty percent of the states in the United States allow for the use of peyote if you're a member of the Native American church, and 50 percent don't. Um, but at least there's some room there to find a place where you can practice what you want in that state, even if you can't do it in some other state. So right. that makes space for diversity in a way that's not true in many other societies. It has been true in some societies. The Ottoman Empire, believe it or not, um, has become an object of discussion and reflection for some people who look back on it as a rather amazing way of accommodating great diversity, cultural diversity. There were over 20 languages spoken in the Ottoman Empire. There was no single language that a majority of people spoke. The center didn't was weak in the sense that it didn't tell local groups what religions they should have. It didn't tell them how to raise their children. It didn't tell them what gender relations they, they had to have. There was a great deal of diversity at that level. And as long as you paid your taxes to the center and you didn't encroach on other people's territories because there was a great deal of geographical subpartitioning right. called um, which allowed for great diversity. So, you know, as we think about multiculturalism, it's very important to think about what political structures are going to be favorable to diversity and which aren't. 
um, which aspects of our legal concepts are going to support diversity, which aren't. So, for example, if you really have a strong tradition of free exercise of religion and you expand that to mean free exercise of culture, that permits more diversity. If you have a strong tradition of privacy or some separation of the public from the private, that permits more room for diversity. Um, once you start saying everything is political, which end, ends up meaning everything is public, which means everything is the business of the state, groups that control the state are going to start imposing their view of how people should live on everyone, and that cuts down on diversity. Um, there's an interesting issue about the emphasis on children's rights versus parental rights. Um, to the extent that you expand the notion of child abuse, and the notion of children's rights, that's likely to work against diversity. To the extent that you have parental rights and family privacy, that probably will support to some degree diversity of one type or another. So, um, mm -hmm. in any case, that's, the, that, that's my quick tour of anthropology. Okay. So I would say within anthropology, um, the meaning of multiculturalism and the objectives of it are going to differ by which faction you're talking to. Right. Well, I think one of the healthy developments in anthropology, and maybe to some extent now in psychology as well, is people are talking about polyculturalism. So people are not only understanding distinctions between cultures, but the extent to which a culture doesn't have an essence and the extent to which American culture itself, despite its diversity, is also influenced by immigrants and every generation of Americans is culturally different because of immigrants who have moved to America within the last, right. you know, every within that generation's existence. Well, I, there is, let me say something about a philosophy that I've sometimes just called Confusionism, not to be confused with Confucianism. Right. Um, there are certain central tenets, but one of the probably the single most important is the notion that the knowable world is incomplete if seen from any one point of view, incoherent if seen from all points of view at once, and empty if you try to see it from nowhere in particular, have no priors that you're committed to. So the choice ends up being between incompleteness, incoherence, and emptiness. Um, faced with that choice, I can never embrace incoherence. That's the end of any kind of debate or attempt at understanding the world. Um, emptiness is a kind of, I mean, structuralists in the social sciences go for emptiness. They want to have a kind of dehumanizing distance on things and get to the deepest aspects, which ultimately take a mathematical form. And at that point, you don't have goals, values, and pictures of the world. You have a description of something very deep and abstract. Um, so I always opt for incompleteness, and I think that what you recognize is that every cultural group is going to have internal diversity, but there's going to be some perspective that has been institutionalized and has continuity and allows people to anticipate what others are going to do, and that requires suppressing to some degree other viewpoints, which are going to find a way to express themselves on the periphery in your dreams, in subgroups that form who want to change the system. Um, there's going to be attempts within the system to utilize what's called voice. There are going to be other people who find it impossible to change the system and want to exit or want to secede. Um, all of these are part of the pro cultural process. There's not, not going to be a homogeneous block ever. But it's also not going to be a world in which everything goes all the time within any group. There definitely are going right. to be central tendencies. There definitely are going to be certain things that are held to be sacred. There are going to be heterodoxies and orthodoxies. The orthodox are going to perceive the heterodox as in some way subversive. Um, cultures are going to vary in the degree to which they tolerate um, heterodoxy or not or work against it. I mean, this is all part of what social scientists both observe and have to try and understand. That's true. Yeah. Um, speaking of heterodoxy, that I think that brings us to the issue of viewpoint diversity. And one issue I wanted to bring up is the um, issue of international students. I myself came to the U.S. as an international student. Mm -hmm. um, and I know over the past, so I came here in 1995, and over the past decades, 
I've definitely seen the percentage of international students, particularly from Asia, consistently grow. So even though in a sense the political, the diversity of political viewpoints in American university may have shrunk, um, you have this cultural diversity now. Do you feel like despite maybe the shrinking of political diversity, American undergraduates are learning a bit more about the world because they're more likely now to come across people from different parts of the world in their very own classrooms and in their dorms? Or do you think maybe there's this homogenizing effect where even foreign undergraduates are, are mainstreamed and local undergraduates are not really understanding that much about other cultures? Well, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it depends on what we're talking about. The, I mean, I, I certainly think that the international, the presence of international students provides opportunities for global international networking and travel both directions. And I think that's all for the good. Um, I think that there's an opportunity to understand that. Uh, let's talk about the culture of the university. Because I think one of the things that you have a great opportunity to understand when students come from other places to an American campus is all the things you've assumed at your own institution, which relate to deep commitments of one type or another to goals, values, and pictures of the world. So for example, I've related in the past a visit of an Indian colleague of mine from an orthodox from a temple town in India who had never been out of India before but who is a friend of mine who I'd collaborated with in India and he came to visit me at the University of Chicago and I took him around to um, my classes um, and he was startled by what he observed I mean first of all when I walked in the room students did not stand up to show respect for my status which would have been a routine thing to happen in an Indian classroom. Males and females were sitting together. This was startling to him. Um, students asked questions and I encouraged it. Okay. Um, he found students sitting outside the classroom on the floor eating food or eating food in the classroom. I mean, this just wasn't his picture of the nature of the structure of learning in an Indian classroom. And he, he really pu was puzzled and I had to explain it to him. And in explaining it to him, I came to realize how special the modern academy, in the, at least in my experience, is where we are really trying to, or at least at the time he came, and this is my picture of what I'll call the modern university, that's not necessarily a description of the contemporary university, which I think is deviating more and more from the ideal I'm about to describe. But what it made me realize is that we're not interested in status to the same degree. We're trying in a way to communicate that we are autonomous individuals at an, at an institution. And we're not there showing deference or respect for X in any explicit way in any case. Um, we're encouraging you to have a perspective, a position that you're prepared to argue. You're prepared, we expect that you are going to welcome it being your convictions being challenged. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's not who you are, but what you're saying, and the arguments you mount in, a, in relationship to it that end up being valued. So I learned something about the embedded values and um, uh, that are in the practice of even giving a lecture or having a classroom in which students don't stand up and males and females sit together because we're not interested in coding your gender. Okay, we're interested in your argument. Um, that of course has changed, and that's part of what's being contested these days. Um, the picture that I just gave is one of an institution in which everyone is welcomed regardless of race, gender, political belief, nationality, as long as they're interested in entering a subculture that has certain sacred values. Okay? And those sacred values include free thought, um, staying on the move between different perspectives, 
welcoming challenges to your own convictions, um, entertaining positions just for the sake of argument. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is sort of a, this is a picture of the modern academy that has values that go with that. Once you start all of a sudden emphasizing status or seeing yourself as a tribal institution with different groups and different tribes, each of whom is really an interest group promoting their picture of the world and really is not interested in challenges to it or challenges get perceived as offensive attacks or as harms, then you've changed the nature of the subculture. And to what degree that subculture has already changed is one of the things I know people at Heterodox Academy are concerned with. I certainly am concerned about it. And whether or not the picture of the modern academy that I just gave um, is sustainable, um, how many people are prepared to defend it, um, these are all issues of the day. I would add that, you know, other things you learn, I mean, if, you know, there, there are students who come from some parts of the world, I know um, when I have lectured in Japan, for example, um, I, I noticed that people were reluctant to ask questions after a lecture would be delivered. And when I inquired about this, the point of view that I was told is that it would seem as though we really didn't engage your lecture if we were immediately to ask a question. We need some time to really process it so that we can ask an, a, a really deep question. But, um, and this has been noticed in other places. I mean, I've had colleagues who've gone to India and given lectures and no one will ask a question and they're very frustrated by it. And these, you know, miscommunications take place over that. But right. one of the things you do learn is that in the American Academy, when you're in a seminar, actually engaging in debate and conversation is part of what's assumed. There are many students who come from abroad who are not comfortable engaging in that kind of debate. And they often sit silently in classrooms and sometimes even feel that there's something wrong about being talkative. Okay. And we have to face up to these cultural clashes because one position is stop having seminars because they somehow value something that it makes other people feel uncomfortable or that they haven't been trained to do where they came from. Um, the other view is no, this is what this institution's about and people have to come to understand that subculture. And if they're going to participate in it, it requires um, some rethinking of their own values and the acquisition of certain skills for doing it. And that, right. of course, raises difficult questions about when people are really prepared to be challenged, prepared to experience what the modern academy was meant to do, which is to create autonomous, free-thinking, critical minds who are committed to critical reason and evidence, logic, including exercising their own critical reason to recognize the limits of critical reason, and then to have to cope with whatever that recognition um, produces. And um, as and you know, there there are always going to be. Uh, I I I had a literary. I had a friend some years ago, no longer alive, who was a well-known literary critic, Anatole Royard, and he used to teach writing, and he used to say to his writing students, hang on to your prejudices, they're the only taste you have got. And, um, and yeah. he wasn't recommending they be prejudiced in a vicious sense, he was getting them to try and look at what they actually bring to the table with regard to their presuppositions, and to see whether or not those presuppositions help them illuminate certain things. And in recognizing those presuppositions to also recognize there are other presuppositions in the world which may illuminate things and to be open to seeing what's illuminated from other perspectives. So, you know, being interested in the other side of the story was at one point a central feature of going to college. I remember when I went to college, I was handed books like In Defense of Anarchy. You know, that was the reading of the day or in defense of hierarchy. Um, 
now egalitarian movements can be so dogmatic that the very thought of being asked to come into a seminar one day, let's discuss the values of hierarchy. Are all inequalities really immoral? Um, maybe it's an inevitable feature of the moral order. Um, you know, to have that kind of discussion now is likely to make people feel um, upset or find the very discussion of it offensive and maybe to even complain to someone and then to want some administrator to look into um, um, you know, these challenging conversations and whether or not they should be accepted or not. Right. Yeah, well, that's a, that raises several interesting issues. As an international student myself, I could give you an extensive explanation of my culturalization process and understanding how to participate in seminars and all the reasons international students are reluctant to participate at first. Some of it has to do with saving face as well and wondering right. whether as a foreigner you have a, your perspective is just embarrassing because it differs so much from the American perspective. One healthy development I've seen now is because there's now a critical mass of international students. Whenever I've taught courses, I've not really found um, a reluctance among South Asian students and East Asian students to speak as much, at least where I teach. And I think that might have something to do with a critical mass. I'm not sure. But um, there are several other questions I have, but it's, uh, I think we need to wrap up. Maybe we can have a, another interview in a few months. I appreciate your time. <laughs> well, I'd be, I'd be happy to do it. Um, and um, thank you for having these kinds of interviews. I think it's useful for people to um, be able to go online go to Heterodox Academy and familiarize themselves with the mentalities of different figures in the social sciences who are willing to do these interviews. So good luck. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.